sleep for sale. The multi-billion dollar sleep industry offers countless and expensive solutions for those having trouble getting some quality shut eye. Is getting enough sleep the new luxury ideal? I'm Malika Bilal. I'm Femi OK. You're in the stream. I'm Alex Pong. I'm author of Rest, Why You Get More Done When You Work Less, and I'm in the stream. Success has often come at the price of sleep for many of the world's most well-known leaders. Thomas Edison, the American inventor of the light bulb, said, sleep is a criminal waste of time. Former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher said, sleep is for whips. Now we know a little bit more about what our bodies are doing when they are asleep. How can sleep deprivation cause such immense suffering? Scientists think the answer lies with the accumulation of waste products in the brain. During our waking hours, our cells are busy using up our day's energy sources, which get broken down into various byproducts, including adenosine. As adenosine builds up, it increases the urge to sleep, also known as sleep pressure. In fact, caffeine works by blocking adenosine's receptor pathways. Other waste products also build up in the brain, and if they're not cleared away, they collectively overload the brain and are thought to lead to the many negative symptoms of sleep deprivation. So what's happening in our brain when we sleep to prevent this? Scientists found something called the glymphatic system, a cleanup mechanism that removes this buildup and is much more active when we're asleep. It works by using cerebrospinal fluid to flush away toxic byproducts that accumulate between cells. Lymphatic vessels, which serve as pathways for immune cells, have recently been discovered in the brain, and they may also play a role in clearing out the brain's daily waste products. But the facts don't make it any easier to fall asleep. Now some business leaders are touting sleep as the new cure-all, and a plethora of apps and gadgets like this. Okay, sense, how did I sleep last night? Your sleep score was 75 are exploding onto the market. They often come with hefty price tags that make them a privilege of the elite. Well, here to help us talk about changing attitudes towards sleep, in the U.S. state of Georgia, Benjamin Reese is the author of Wild Nights, How Taming Sleep Created Our Restless World. He's also a professor at Emory University. Jeff Eiliff is a neuroscientist and researcher at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. Marcy Bianco is a writer and cultural critic, critic in Stanford, California. Also in California, Claudia Aguirre is also a neuroscientist. Good to have you here, everybody. Uh, true confessions, who has a sleep gadget or app or something that they use in order to get to sleep other than just closing their eyes and going to sleep? Ben, what do you I have? Don't, I don't have any such gadgets. Nothing. Jeff? No. Yeah, I, I have one that I use when I travel because hotel rooms sound very different than my usual sleeping environment, so I have to have a white noise generator. Otherwise, I can't sleep at all when I travel. What does the white noise generator look like? It, it's just an app on my phone. Oh, so okay. it's just a free app that lets out a constant stream of just noise that drowns out every, all the other noises around. That would drive me mad, but that helps you sleep. Yeah, well, because you're surrounded by all of these different noises yeah. all the time, you know, people in the hallway or even just the silence of a room that you're unaccustomed to. And that is that's disruptive to me, at least. It totally wakes me up. And so having something that fills in all, all the all the gaps in the in the, the kind of the sonic landscape that mm. actually helps me sleep a great deal. Masi, what do you have? Anything? Oh, nothing. 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 I watch The Jeffersons, you know, the TV show from the <laughs> 70s and 80s, and then I go to sleep. Okay. <laughs> Claudia, what do you have? Anything? Um, I, I do, actually, because yeah. I, tr I travel a lot, um, so I'm often in a hotel room, um, so I need to have my own personal techniques and methods at night. Um, yeah. I use music quite a bit. Um, even Moby released uh, a, a soothing spa kind of track um, <laughs> album, actually. Yeah. Um, and so I either use sleep music or I also, um, this is going to sound a little weird, but yeah. I've been kind of getting into, um, there's an app called Calm, and they have sleep stories, and they're literally bedtime stories. Um, so you can just listen to them, and it does actually, you know, soothe and kind of calm you down. Um, I make sure, you know, that the, the room is dark, mm -hmm. and um, 
and just have something for me it's very audio uh, audio related so I do want to have something that's going to um, just keep my minds from you know thinking too much about my lectures or whatever I'm doing and really focus on the music and the sounds that I'm listening to do you ever hear the end of the story that you're listening to to get to sleep do you, do you like, whatever happened in that story yeah. Yeah. Um, I have fallen asleep through the stories. Um, yeah. Some of them are just, you know, uh, poems or, or, you know, naturalistic stories. So really describing scenes of nature. And it really also helps me to be in a natural setting or listen to sounds of nature. Um, I find them quite calming as well. Claudia, Could you're I jump not in the and make a one. Point? Uh, Claudia isn't the only one. I wanted to share these two tweets. This is Aditi on Twitter. She says, I listen to podcasts, no visual stimulation. And on days when it's hard to sleep, I listen to Sleep With Me. It's known to put people to sleep. That's the name of one of those. But she got a little bit of pushback. This is from Sheikh Wasim, who says, these make sleep and hence us technology dependent, as if sleep was unnatural and complicated. Jeff, is that ever a worry for you that your white noise machine makes you dependent on it? Yeah, but that, that I think that comment uh, presupposes that our normal sleep environment is itself uncomplicated, and I don't think that's true. I think a lot of us live in cities or live in dense housing situations or even with other people uh, where, you know, we are surrounded by noise all the time, and it's just a matter of coping with the world that we find around us, which, which is what we have to do day to day. Ben, you were going to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, um, it's interesting to look at this historically because... Um, it, it's, it's sort of an oddity of the way we train our children to sleep and, um, and expect to sleep as we grow up, that we control our environment and that we sleep in a quiet, noise-free space. And through the span of human history, that was unavailable for, for most people. Um, it was more common for people to sleep with sounds of nature quite close to them. And nature is noisy. If you ever try to sleep out in the woods, there are a lot of noises. And, and people need cues to, to, um, to fall asleep. But one of the things that we've done in the last couple of hundred years in um, highly technological society is try to seal off sleep from our environment. And so the expectation that, um, that we either um, you know, have a noise-free space, a climate-controlled space, a customizable surface, um, these are things that we do, I think, get, get quite used to. And when there are changes to those routines, many of us can't handle it. And so we need things like white noise machines or, or other kinds of um, technological dev devices to, um, to compensate for these, for these changes and try to control our environment. I'm just wondering, That's very new historically. Yeah, I I'm wondering if there's science or there's scam with these gadgets. I'm not going to ask you specifically, but let me show you this one. Uh, Retimer. They're goggles that adjust the lights, help you your sleep pattern work out very nicely. You can buy it now for $299. Thank you. I'll pass on that one. But let me show you this. Hello, it's a monitor. It monitors your sleep as you sleep and tells you how to sleep better. One more. The Sleep Plus Sleep Sensor, the world's first non-contact sleep sensor. Jeff, do you see these and then snort? Or do you see these and go, oh, yes, good science here. Uh, I, I actually think it's a little bit of both. I, th I think it's it's a science that is maybe not ready for prime time, right? So the <laughs> okay. idea the idea yeah. behind them is, is reasonable, which is um, hey, let's let's count how much sleep that we're getting so we can get a reasonable estimate of how healthy we are. The same way we count our blood cholesterol, um, and let's maybe try to optimize that given the the environments that we live in. I think the real question is. Are these solutions, do they actually do what they say they do? So can we actually quantify sleep stages accurately and in a, in a validated way? And I think the, um, the general consensus is no, not really. I think that at this point in the game, it's, it's a little bit more hype than it is substance. So I, wanted I, to bring... I agree with that. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say I agree because a lot of the gadgets, um, I mean, I've used my, my Apple Watch to just track sleep using an app. And in, in a way, it kind of is a, it's almost a little bit more specific because it's actually, you know, connected to your body. But these devices that are, you know, connected to your pillow, 
I feel like there's so much that can happen in a bedroom overnight. You know, your kids can run in or your dogs, yeah. um, or there could be, you know, a noise outside. Um, you could be moving um, or your partner could be moving. So that could move your pillow or you could push your pillow aside and there goes your whole sleep cycle research. Um, so, you know, the research in the sleep laboratory, I think, is definitely there. How we translate that into a consumer product, um, we're not quite there yet, but I, I'm really excited about the science that's going into this and, and potentially um, creating products that really do, uh, you know, thoroughly uh, assess our sleep levels. And that actually can feed back into changes in our lifestyle. So when we talk about the science behind that, which you said you're excited about, uh, we got a video comment from someone who you heard a little bit earlier in the show doing an I'm in the stream. This is Alex, and he's the author of a book called Rest, and he talks about the luxury of sleep and why that might be a misnomer. Have a listen. You know, sometimes we talk about sleep as a luxury, and of course there's a whole industry that's built up around the idea of luxurious sleep. And as cool as that is, I think there's an unintended consequence to it. Today, when we live in a world in which sleep deprivation is seen as a sign of professional seriousness or commitment to your work, it's easier to see sort of sleep as something other than an absolute necessity as a source of, you know, or of physical restoration and psychological rejuvenation. When we talk about sleep as a luxury then, it's important not to talk about it as only a luxury, but also to recognize that it's a necessity. So all of our guests were nodding their heads there at that comment, but let's talk about the science behind this. Alex, I know this is, uh, excuse me, Jeff, I know this is something that you uh, study, what Alex here is talking about. Why do we need to sleep? Well, things are happening while you're asleep that your body needs to do. So sleep evolved uh, very, very early in, in uh, the development of complex organisms. We see sleep structure like you see in a human in actually lizards. You see it in really almost any animal that you can imagine. And so it's, it must be important. And so what we understand now is that there's very specific sort of housekeeping functions happening within the brain that are, that are occurring during sleep. We know that memory is being consolidation, consolidated during sleep. We know that your neurons, which are the kind of electrical cells in, in your brain, they grow through the course of the day as you experience more and more things. And the extra limbs on those on those trees get pruned away during sleep, and that's important for your brain to sort of stay balanced. And we know that uh, that waste byproducts that otherwise would harm the brain are being cleared away during during sleep. So it is it is necessary, and its necessity is shown by how far down the the animal family tree you see it. I'm just wondering from a more sort of society point of view, which is kind of the way that you delved into it, Ben, have, how much things have actually changed or, or did the Victorians say, if it wasn't for this invention, we would have more sleep? Uh, have we always been sort of grasping it over, how do we get a little bit more sleep? How do we become more rested? Or is this a very modern phenomenon and a very developed world phenomenon? Well, there have been sleep troubles as long as there have been humans, and the mm. philosopher E.M.C. Oren defined humans as the insomniac animal. But I do think there are certain <laughs> pressures that have been put on sleep in the last uh, couple of hundred years that have deformed it into some strange kinds of mutations, mm. uh, particularly since the advent of the Industrial Revolution and the spread of, of powerful uh, modes of artificial light. Uh, that yeah. people's sleep patterns have come detached from, from natural rhythms of sun rising and falling or changes in season. And uh, increasingly, we're told to make our sleep conform to certain rules that are, um, that are very hard for many, many people to, to, to fit themselves for to. For example, so yeah, go ahead. for example, sleep rules. So uh, sleeping, seven, doing all of your sleep in about seven to eight hours all at once at night sleeping in a, uh, a private space apart from all other people or maybe sharing with one consenting adult, uh, uh -huh. sleeping, having strict pre-bed rituals and going to bed about the same time every night. And one of the biggest ones is children sleeping apart from parents, sleeping alone in their own rules, which in m many parts of the world, um, but especially in, in uh, Europe and North America, is a, is a kind of moral dictate. All of these things are, are cultural expectations that are brought to sleep, but that almost nobody anywhere practiced before about the turn of the 19th century in the West. 
and uh, and and they're they're difficult for many people to accomplish. Mostly from I think also the the, the point. Oh, sorry, yeah, go but ahead. The, the point of chronotypes. Um, I think people. Some people are night owls, and some people are early birds, and some mm. people are all sorts of different animals that uh, have been de designated, you know, uh, sleep types. And I think that is important because you can suffer from social sleep deprivation, um, meaning a, a teenager um, that isn't going to bed until midnight but has to go to you know, school at 7 in the morning, um, they're going to suffer because they're not going to get those quality 9 to 10 hours of sleep. Or someone that's working shifts, um, late shifts, uh, someone that is more prone to um, a late morning um, but maybe working later towards the evening. Mm -hmm. So our societal constructs of saying here's a 9 to 5 job job, here's an eight to three school. Um, it really doesn't fit everybody's physiology, in my opinion. I'm just wondering, Marcy, is there yes. an upside to this? Because I've seen the articles about so-and-so runs this company. They don't sleep. In fact, I exist on cigarettes, coffee, and two and a half <laughs> hours sleep, and that's my weekend. Um, <laughs> is there something in our, in our society that is saying, not enough sleep, that's good. It means that you're working really well. Well, I think there's, in recent years, especially even a cultural capital around this idea of not sleeping, right, and touting it as some kind of, um, you know, some kind of ability to transcend human norms, right, and human capabilities that mere mortals need sleep, and yet I'm a super superman and I do not need sleep at all. And, you know, to even her credit, Ariana Huffington saw this as being a very gendered understanding of work that men, she attributes it to men espousing this idea that, you know, they don't need to work, therefore, you know, or they don't need to sleep, therefore, that, you know, they're more able to be successful uh, workers and, and leaders of corporations. I don't know how much I necessarily buy that. I mean, I am interested in what everyone else is saying about this ideal of sleep. It never existed. I mean, we can all look at our own families and see people who have worked shift work their entire lives. Or my grandfather was from Calabria and he lived in a one room home with a donkey and his entire family. I'm sure he did not get any sleep whatsoever. Um, you know, so I, we have this ideal. And for me, what's really interesting in this digital age is that we're mapping technology onto the ideal and imagining technology to be the cure-all for our sleeplessness and for the kind of exploitation that we've seen in this growing uh, capital, capitalistic world. And that, to me, is the point of interest. So we asked mm -hmm. our community about their very sleep patterns and, and how they get sleep, and Super Ninja told us, being tired all the time. But being tired all the time has an impact, Jeff. Tell us about the research that you've done and you know about connecting Alzheimer's to not sleeping enough, because that yeah. might literally make somebody today listening to this change their sleep pattern. Well, whether it makes anyone change their sleep patterns, I think is, is uh, we'll find out. Uh, but what I, what I think is emerging in our understanding of health is that the consequences of not sleeping, the consequences of, of being tired all the time don't extend just to tomorrow and next week, right? So I get a poor night's sleep tonight because my kids are up sick all night yeah. um, and I have, a, I have a terrible week at, at work and that happens to all of us. Um, or, you know, I'm deployed in the military for a long period of time and that, that is a lifestyle of lack of sleep for very, very long stretches of time. That's, that's a thing for many, many people worldwide. Um, what we're starting to understand now are the con long-term consequences for that kind of disruption. They go beyond my performance the next day, but they may extend to chronic diseases like cancer, cardiovascular disease, like so heart, heart disease, uh, diabetes, which is becoming a worldwide epidemic. Uh, and now we're starting to see evidence that there's, that there's an association with, of lack of sleep or sleep disruption with diseases like Alzheimer's disease, which are not which are no longer diseases simply of the developed world, but are uh, diseases that are spreading mm -hmm. all throughout the world. So um, I think what may change how we think about it is, is the ability to pull things apart from just how I feel tomorrow to, you know, how am I going to be when I'm 30 years older and my kids, you know, and I have grandkids and I want to be able to communicate and participate with them in their lives. And I think that that changes our framework a great deal. So here are a few more effects. So we tweeted this out to our community. Is sleep becoming a luxury reserved for the wealthy? This research uh, uh, says perhaps this is the 
part that one of our community members uh, uh, really it caught their eye. This is M. Pato who says, sleep deprivation actively shrinks your brain. And that's from that research and that's uh, published in The Atlantic. He says this quickly turns into a topic of being overworked. The ugly twist, how the wealthy then laud this when really it's bad for you. One other effect, though, is via video comment. We got a video comment from a psychologist, Tiffany Yip, uh, at Fordham University. And she talks about the link between sleep deprivation and ethnic discrimination, something I'd never thought of before. Have a listen to what she told us. What we found in our research is that on days in which adolescents report being targeted for discrimination, that same evening they also sleep less well. And what's really interesting is that the following day they also tend to report higher levels of anxiety and lower levels of in-school engagement. And what this suggests is that sleep um, plays an important explanatory role in linking social experiences of discrimination to adolescent development and health outcomes. And so it underscores the importance of sleep for adolescent youth and outcome. So Ben, what do you make of that research? Well, it's fascinating research. and. Um, one of the puzzles about sleep from a scientific standpoint is why we have to be so vulnerable and immobilized while we do it. Um, and one of the things that I've been interested in, in looking at historically and culturally is the way that different groups manage that vulnerability. And, you know, some of our, pr our previous commenters have talked about sleep as a luxury item. You know, it costs a lot of money and takes a lot of resources in, able, in order to be able to sleep well in today's world. And those who don't have those resources, for, for many of these people, sleep is an, is an unimaginable ordeal. Refugees, uh, people who are fleeing natural disasters, homeless people. And in my work, I trace it back, uh, the, the, some of the racial disparities that, that Tiffany Yip is talking about, back to um, the earliest origins of our nation as a slaveholding country. And if you look at the literature of slavery, it's a, it's a literature of unimaginable sleep deprivation. Nighttime becomes a time of torment um, when uh, an entire class of people was systematically dis deprived of the, the um, circumstances necessary to get a restful night's sleep. And, and that, those, uh, that created a whole cascading set of effects on, on health and well-being, well mental well-being as well as physical, um, that were often blamed on African Americans uh, from the time of slavery forward, a, a poorly rested people systematically poorly rested who were often blamed for quote unquote laziness. Mm. Um, it's a really a, a kind of horrifying story in, in American cultural history. It also pulls us up quite short in the conversation that we're having, which seems to quite an elitist conversation to have about gadgets and how do we get more sleep and our yeah, lifestyle. Exactly. But there are some people who have no option about how much sleep can they get in a day? How is that even possible? Marcy? Yeah. I mean, no, absolutely. This uh, this idea of privileging sleep and that it is a luxury, it's a very, um, it is a very elitist discussion because yeah. not everyone has the ability to determine when they sleep, how they sleep, where they sleep. Yeah. Uh, at the same time as well, we know that there is a number of studies that show people with lower SES, uh, people who are of color, women, any kind of oppressed minority group are fundamentally unable to rest their bodies. They are always on a state of, at a state of awareness, right? Their bodies are awake. And we can tra track this through history, but and additionally, I think um, thinking about today's world, yeah. the heightened anxiety that we face and that we feel um, adds those pressures to how we live daily. And yes, sleep is becoming more fraught and more problematic for a number of minorities. All right, so yes, I hope you're yeah. well rested for this bit because I'm going to give yeah. you, we have a minute. Your top tip for sleeping well is <laughs> what? Ben, one thing. Re one thing you could teach Rethink us. the rules. Ah, nice. Figure out what the rules are and how you can get around them. Jeff. <laughs> uh, don't forget the rules because you live in a real environment and not a theoretical environment and uh -huh. you need to put rules in place that overcome that environment. Marcy? Uh, become a multi-millionaire and a straight white man. Oh, <laughs> so practical, Marcy. I'm going to do that That's tomorrow. That's a great idea. Claudia. <laughs> um, disconnect. 
I, I, we can all do that. That's not an elitist thing to do. You can turn off, you know, the devices. You can go for a walk. You can yeah. read a book if you want, or you can just shut down and uh, close your eyes for a bit, um, even taking a little nap. So I think disconnecting is a is there something everyone can do. All right. Malika. John says the sleep bank. He discovered it while on the overnight shift. If you need to stay up all night, banking sleep before helps. Or does it? <laughs> <laughs> our expert guests will tell you in our post show at stream.aljazeera.com. If you're watching online, you need to go to our special page, stream.aljazeera.com, and this conversation will continue there. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you soon. Hello, everybody. I'm glad you found our post show. We have a great lineup of guests who have different perspectives on sleep. We left you at the end of the main show with this concept, not ours, but of one of our mm. viewers of a sleep bank, banking your sleep. I sleep at the weekends. Yeah. <laughs> this, this could explain a lot of how I host the show. <laughs> I don't really sleep during the week. Malika, what, what was that the tweet again? Just so this us. was John's tweet about working the radio overnight shift. He says he banks his sleep. He says it means that sleeping more in advance of an overnight shift works better than catching up later. Improved health of our team vastly, he says. So, Claudia, the science before this, because I know we've all read things that say you can't really catch up on sleep. Can you store it? Can you store your sleep in a sleep bank before you need it? Um, it in some ways, the, the way sleep works is obviously a continuous process. The neurons, the glia, all of the mechanisms that happen in the brain, um, it's, a, it's a continuous process. So to think that um, you can actually, you know, hold uh, the, the benefits of sleep um, for a post, uh, you know, a day later or something, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really work that way. But there's also there could be an effect psychologically, um, <laughs> meaning that somebody that really does believe that they're um, performing better, they will perform better. Um, does that mean biochemically that they've, uh, you know, secured some of the synaptic growth or something in the brain? Maybe not. So I was just watching Jess Face when we were talking about banking sleep, and Jess Face was saying, no, doofus. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. I would never say that. No. <laughs> Maybe so, it was just me feeling particularly sensitive about how I approach sleep. Jeff, <laughs> be no, candid. I, 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 I think it, it actually represents a, a pretty important misconception. So your body has two different sleep drives. One is entrained to how much you're awake and then how much you sleep. It's that sleep substance uh, and sleep pressure thing that was in the graphic at the very beginning of the show. Um, but the other is the circadian clock, which is timed to the light-dark cycle. And our ability to get off of the natural light-dark cycle and because of artificial lighting and technology is actually the feature of the modern world that makes our relationship with sleep so complicated. And actually yeah, the, yeah. this kind of skewing of, of that relationship where on some days you have one relationship, but then on Saturday and Sunday you have a completely different relationship mm. actually may be part of the problem um, and may actually, I don't know that it does more harm than, than good, but it, I don't think it's necessarily part of the solution. Ben, have you seen cultures where they feel you, you look at them and you think, oh, they've got this sleep thing down. They're well rested. <laughs> they're not exhausted going through the day. Does that place exist? It's really hard to know. Hmm. Uh, I, I think there, there are what we can say about at least the society that I live in in the U.S. and increasingly much of the highly developed um, and technology dependent world is that we put certain kinds of pressure on sleep uh, that have simply never existed before. And I think we're kind of living in a sleep obsessed society. One of the things that's, that's really changed and deformed sleep in recent years is, um, is globalization and the, um, and the digital economy where, you know, people are often you know, in, in um, parts of the world that are serving other people's technological needs. They're up at three in the morning to answer somebody's call about a computer glitch. Um, and and uh, so the concept of time zones for a lot of people, particularly in that sort of second tier, uh, elect, you know, electronic service um, uh, oriented economies in the world ha has become completely unglued from any kind of naturally occurring rhythm of, of light and darkness. And, and that's something that's 
that's quite new and it's, a, it's increasingly a global phenomenon. So following up on that, we got this tweet uh, from Talua who says, is it actually possible to train your body to adapt to certain hours of sleep? And Marcy, I'll give this to you for practical implications because I know you used to work as a freelancer and now you have more of a, a full-time position. Yes. Um, yes. Have you seen a difference and were you able to train your body when you were a freelancer with those different hours? Uh, train my body in terms of just always being awake and always being alert. And I, I don't think there was ever a state of absolute rest for my body, but I think it also is a confluence for individual people. It's a confluence of myriad factors in their lives. So it could be their gender. It could be their race. It could be their economic status. It could be their immigration status. I mean, I know that every time my wife travels, I'm worried about her being detained at the airport, especially in an, in an American city these days. So I think it really depends on the individual and their own lives. And in terms of training the body, absolutely, I used to be an athlete. You can train the body. But does that result in actual rest and restfulness so that your mind yeah. can function properly? That's debatable. I would debate that. All right. Uh, uh, Jeff, how, how many hours a night do you get sleep on average? So on average, I'm probably around six and a half, seven. And I actually want to comment on that previous comment. Yeah, I think okay. that making that distinction between being able to function on short sleep, because we, I, th I think you see examples all over the place where that is possible. Whether we should do that and what the long-term consequences mm. of that are, I think that's what the new perspective is. Um, okay. But seven hours, there's six and a half, seven hours is my answer. All right, okay. Uh, ben, I think that how much sleep do you get? I get about the same as Jeff. Uh, right. between six and seven a night. Uh, one thing I do, I want to point out, I heard a fascinating lecture by an evolutionary biologist who was studying a, uh, a hunter-gatherer group in, um, in Mozambique, I believe, mm -hmm. that, and found that, um, that this group um, that didn't have a lot of the um, highly uh, you know, technological pressures on sleep that exist in more economically developed parts of the world, didn't have uh, electric lighting didn't have um, computers, televisions, etc., um, and um, and and did tend to sleep um, according to naturally occurring rhythms of of light and darkness and change in season. They also only averaged about six to six and a half hours of sleep, and it was really? a great puzzle for him about why that was so. And and he made a distinction in evolutionary terms. He said, you know, what is uh, an evolutionary advantage for people in terms of um, increasing their likelihood of reproduction is not always necessarily advantage to them in terms of long-term health consequences. So if you're only sleeping six to seven hours and you have that kind of chronotype, um, you, you might be more likely to reproduce because you have more opportunity while you're awake. Uh, <laughs> but not but, if you're tired. <laughs> well, but but it, it, downstream, you know, 20, 30 years later, yeah. your body might really start to, to wear down from it. Ah. And, and so yeah. so there's there, the, the idea of what's natural or evolutionary might not be the same as what's healthful. Yeah. You've just given us so many things to think about. I think everybody sort of knows what good sleep health might look like, but I'm not sure everybody practices it or is able to practice it. Thank you guests so much for today's show. Really appreciate it. Malika. I will leave us with this tweet from uh, Lord McNoble. That's his Twitter handle. He says, I get four to five hours. I wouldn't mind 10 to 12, but my bank account won't let him. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a pleasure having you on the stream. Take care.